to make a contribution to Kezcast and after a uh, little thought I decided to speak about uh, a poem which I like very much. It's entitled This Lime Tree Bower My Prison and it's by Samuel Taylor Coleridge who's one of my favourite poets uh, and I thought it'd be a, a good thing to do to try and take you through the poem and also point some things out as we're going through it. So this is a poem where actually a little bit of context is quite useful. It's a slightly strange title, isn't it? This lime tree bower, my prisoner bower, is a a little protective area covered with trees, uh, often done artificially. Um, But as a prison? So the poem itself is addressed to Charles Lamb of the India House London. Lamb was a very good friend of Coleridge they'd been at school together um, and this poem was written in the summer of 1797 there's a bit of confusion about exactly when it was written because Coleridge himself said it was written in June um, but most scholars think that it was actually in July um, Coleridge was living in Nether Stowey with his wife and children Nether Stowey is uh, still a a nice little village in the north of Somerset, uh, very close to the Devon border, very close to the coast. And Coleridge had been living there for a a short while, and it was his plan to to write great poetry in this beautiful area, because uh, just to the north is the coast and the Bristol Channel and so on, Uh, but all around uh, to the south and to the east are the Quantock Hills and Coleridge was uh, fascinated and a devotee of walking and um, he had the good fortune of uh, meeting Wordsworth, William Wordsworth and his sister Dorothy. Um, They'd met some time before this but in recent months the Wordsworths had deliberately come to live down in the same area with Coleridge and there was clearly a view that uh, the two great poets uh, were going to work together on some significant piece of work. Uh, and in what they eventually produced and published in 1798 was lyrical ballads, and in some ways probably the, the most significant poetic publication of that period. Um, and although... The two poets' names are on the title of the book. It shouldn't go unnoticed that Dorothy Wordsworth made uh, an immeasurable contribution in the way that she both supported them but and encouraged them, but more importantly, the way she talked about and observed nature and discussed ideas to do with poetry with them. Anyway, Lamb came down to visit and... Coleridge had been looking forward to this for ages because he wanted to show his deep friend the the beauty of the area. Lamb had been suffering uh, in in all sorts of ways. Uh, He had a series of family tragedies and so forth. And uh, so pitched up in the summer of 1797. But just before he arrived there was an accident in the house. So Coleridge describes it like this. In the June 1797, some long-expected friends paid a visit to the author's cottage, talking about himself, and on the morning of their arrival, he met with an accident which disabled him from walking during the whole of their stay. One evening, when they had left him for a few hours, he composed the following lines in the garden bower. So the, the the accident, he later admitted to uh, another poet of the period, Southey, Robert Southey. The accident was that his wife that morning had accidentally spilt uh, a pan of boiling milk on his foot and ankle. And that had swollen up and meant that Coleridge couldn't walk for the entire time that Lamb was there with 
some others. And th this was a, a great sadness to Coleridge because he wanted to show the area off. Well, they went off walking uh, one evening and he sat in his garden in the bower created by lime trees and, uh, and then allowed his imagination to range. Now, you need really to have a copy of this poem in front of you and uh, if you uh, wanted to hear a, a really excellent reading of it, there's, there's several on YouTube, but in my opinion the best one is by an old actor, he's dead now, called Ralph Richardson. Uh, he captures the spirit of it, I think, entirely well. I'll read bits of it as we're going through, but not the whole thing. So, here we go. Well, they are gone, and here must I remain, this lime tree bower, my prison. I have lost beauties and feelings such as would have been most sweet to my remembrance, even when age had dimmed mine eyes to blindness. They, meanwhile, my friends, whom I never more may meet again on springy heath, along the hilltop edge, wandering gladness, and wind down perchance to that still roaring dell of which I told, the roaring dell, all wooded, narrow, deep, and only speckled by the midday sun, where its slim trunk, the ash, from rock to rock, flings like, arching like a bridge, that branchless ash, unsunned and damp, whose few poor yellow leaves ne'er tremble in the gale, yet tremble still, fanned by the waterfall. And there, my friends, behold the dark green file of long, lank weeds, that almost at once a most fantastic sight, still nod and drip beneath the dripping edge of the blue clay stone. So it's a poem that's not written in stanza form. It's written in verse paragraphs. And that verse paragraph that begins it is probably about 18 or 20 lines long. He begins rather glumly and you can hear him that, well, they are gone. But even in the second line, he uses the exclamation mark, my prison. And I think the tone is clearly self-mocking. He's stuck there, he's feeling fed up, and he's uh, over-dramatising slightly. The form, which is something that Coleridge invented, really, is often called by scholars a uh, conversation poem. Uh, it, it, most of Coleridge's poetry falls into two broad categories, one that you might call supernatural poetry, and people most commonly know The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and, of course, uh, Kubla Khan, Xanadu did Kubla Khan. The, these, these poems where fantasy and um, uh, extraordinary visions combine. The conversation poems, and this is probably the second of them, he'd written one slightly earlier uh, about a musical instrument, much more like the poet is sitting there having a conversation with you, the reader, musing, going down little blind alleys, thinking things through, turning back on himself, repeating his ideas, but developing them in a different way. Um, this, this form and the verse, basically it's iambic pentameter, but, but moving in and out and up and down and doubling back on itself is entirely appropriate for describing an experience which is an imagined walk, an imagined walk in a, a piece of countryside that is not level, that has up and down all over the place and little, little uh, valleys that you need to drop into and uh, crossings over streams and so on and then bursting out with a view of the sea. He imagines them walking on the springy heath and on the hilltop edge and then down into the roaring dell and then that dell of which I told. <laughs> you know, I, I told them all about this and I wanted to show it to them and I'm not allowed to. Uh, it always strikes me that slim trunk 
the ash. There's an ash tree down in this dell that's going across, growing across like a bridge uh, across this very small waterfall. Uh, and he notices that the, the few poor leaves don't get any wind because wind can't reach down there, but the, the, the leaves still tremble, um, affected by the power of the waterfall, fanned by the waterfall. I sometimes wonder whether he, he identifies himself with that poor ash tree, the slim trunk slung across. And he, he therefore is, of course, imagining what his friends are seeing. He would have been there. He wanted to show it off to Charles Lamb. The poem's addressed to Lamb. But he's on his own at the moment, so the poem's also to himself. Um, there's a great deal of warmth, I think, and friendship. Friendship was terribly important to, to, to Coleridge. Um, OK, he, f he claims to be stuck in prison, but, but he's not really. He's, uh, he's joining them in his imagination. And then it intensifies in the next section. Now my friends emerge beneath the wide, wide heaven and view again the many steepled tracks, magnificent of hilly fields and meadows and the sea. I can even imagine a little boat or two bobbing about on the sea as his, uh, his friends are looking across to the Bristol Channel and in the distance even the, the coast of, of Wales. Um, and then he directly addresses Charles, my gentle-hearted Charles, which he calls Charles gentle-hearted two or three times in this poem. For thou hast pined and hungered after nature many a year in the great city pent, winning thy way with sad yet patient soul through evil and pain and a strange calamity. Ah, slowly stink behind the western ridge, thou glorious sun, shine in the slant beams of the sinking orb, ye purple heath flowers, richly aburn ye clouds, live in the yellow light, ye distant groves, and kindle thou blue ocean. Um, I often think Coleridge is, is sort of acting as a kind of film director there. He's imagining the scene that they can see as they're standing up, looking across the sea as it's getting into evening and the sun, glorious and red, is, is dipping into the sea and changing the colours and the hues of everything that can be seen around. It's burning more richly all the time. Um, it's the kind of thing that, as I say, a film director would imagine and then seek to create. He wants to give not only the poem, but he wants to give the, the, the view and the experience to his friend Lamb, who's have having problems in London and when he goes back to London Courage intends for Lamb to be able to remember this experience and that that will that will that will heal him, that will encourage him. Even though Coleridge is on his own and he's imagining his friends out and about the whole poem is suffused with a with a recognition of an awareness of um, connectedness, of wholeness, of oneness. Um, he can be with his friends through his imagination, and in some ways, that that imaginative journey is as powerful, more powerful. It doesn't matter really, but it 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 engages him fully as if he were with them. And then he imagines Charles being overwhelmed. So my friend, struck with deep joy, may stand, as I have stood, silent with swimming sense. Yea, gazing round on the wide landscape, gaze till all doth seem less gross than bodily, and of such hues as veil the almighty spirit 
when yet he makes spirits perceive his presence. Now, even as I'm trying to read it, you can hear that and sort of breaking into a whispering, reverent tone. And I think for Coleridge, this this is practically a religious experience. What he's imagining Charles seeing is so extraordinarily beautiful and powerful that for a start it it intoxicates him that that idea of swimming sense it's it's again an, an image that we have from from cinema and, and television film where somebody imagines that they're um, going to a different place or, or or they go to sleep and they go into a dream and where the the screen goes all wavy a swimming sense he can't see it clearly anymore because his his vision is affected by the beauty yeah gazing round on the white gaze it's a very coleridgean word to gaze it's not enough to glimpse or to look or to see but gaze so that you kind of become as one with the object you're staring at and and it takes you over there's a strong sense of spirituality as he tries to account for the experience of such hues as veil the almighty spirit when yet he makes spirits perceive his presence. It's, it's like what we might call God choosing to make himself evident to human beings. But of course God can't just come because that would be too extraordinary. So it's it's finding a, a way, maybe the beauty of nature or some amazing piece of music or indeed a fantastic poem that makes you think, wow, there's stuff beyond. Of course, these perceptions that Coleridge is, is sharing with the reader, they're, they're all, well, partly remembered because he's done this walk himself dozens, if not more, times and a enjoyed it so it's partly remembered but it's partly of course imagined recreated um, and that's a very important uh, concept for Coleridge and for Wordsworth the idea that it's never absolutely real what you're writing about it's never documentary realism because your imagination is is adding to it and then there's another break and a new verse paragraph and Coleridge starts to become aware of himself in his bower again. A delight comes sudden on my heart and I am glad as I myself were there. It's actually, it's as though he, he were there. But then he thinks about the riches that he's uh, gained through being in his bower. Nor in this bower, this little lime tree bower, have I not marked much that has soothed me. Pale beneath the blaze hung the transparent foliage, and I watch some broad and sunny leaf, and love to see the shadow of the leaf and stem above dappling its sunshine. And that walnut tree was richly tinged, and a deep radiance lay full in the ancient ivy which usurps those fronting elms and now with blackest mass makes their dark branches gleam a lighter hue through the late twilight and though now the bat wheels silent by and not a swallow twitters yet still the solitary humble bee sings in the bean flower henceforth I shall know that nature ne'er deserts the wise and pure. No plot so narrow be but nature there, no waste so vacant, but may well employ each faculty of sense and keep the heart awake to love and beauty. An extraordinary detail. The, the, everything he's noticing, little leaves, the play of sunlight on those leaves, the the little details of oh there's a bat and there's no there's no swallows now it's getting too late into the evening but there's still a bumblebee in the bean flower singing around You're aware of how quiet it is i'm doing that whispering thing again it's so quiet that he can hear the bumblebee 
And it makes him aware that there's nowhere where nature isn't, where the beauty of the natural world cannot be perceived. So he may not be with his friends looking at a, a, an amazing view, but here he is stuck in his garden with his bad foot, but he can still take nourishment from what is around him. And then he comes to a really striking awareness. And sometimes it is well to be bereft of promised good, that we may lift the soul and contemplate with lively joy the joys we cannot share. Sometimes it's really good not to be part of it. And particularly if you were Coleridge, who, who was always talking, always the centre of attention, always the cleverest person in the room, or on the walk, or thought he was. It's sometimes good, he realises, not to be there and to allow others to enjoy it and to imagine it. My gentle-hearted Charles, he says again, when the last rook beat its straight path along the dusky air homewards, I blessed it, deeming its black wing now a dim speck, now vanishing in light. Across the mighty orb's dilated glory, while thou stoodst gazing, or when all was still, flew creaking o'er thy head, and had a charm for thee, my gentle hearted Charles, to whom no sound is dissonant which tells of life. So, this image of the rook right at the end. It's flying over Coleridge's garden and he sees it and he blesses it. Interesting, within a few months he, he writes The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner where he commits the, it's not he, the Ancient Mariner commits the great sin of killing the albatross and eventually the only way he can redeem himself is when he blesses all the creatures around him. And I bless them unaware. So Coleridge blesses this rook and imagines that actually Charles has seen the rook either flying straight across uh, the setting sun or getting even closer, flying straight over Charles's head, making his, uh, his rookie noise. This spirit of giving, this great generosity of spirit is... is coming out of Coleridge constantly at this point and he's seeing the connections there's the rook I've seen it Charles has seen it that binds us together and he finishes on that extraordinary humble beautiful note no sound is dissonant which tells of life basically the, the beauty of nature, the natural world, the organic, everything living as one. That's where we see real community and beauty. It's, um, it's a wonderful poem at any time. It explores the imagination. This is an imaginative walk that Coleridge goes on. Um, and one of the most famous walks in literature, which of course never actually happened, or at least not for Coleridge. It's full of beauties. It's extraordinary vision, both detailed visions of nature itself, but, but also vast imaginative visions touching on spirituality and the divinity. It's about the the deep joys of friendship. It's about the joy of giving. Um, it's about love, obviously. Um, quite extraordinary poem. I haven't done it justice, but uh, I really would recommend that you, at some point, take the time to read it. Thank you.